<laughs> Thank you, Simon. That's very um, So I'm going to be talking a little bit about our undoing and the fight for social justice. Um, we are all born into a set of intersecting identities. For me, I am a heterosexual Asian woman. I am an able-bodied immigrant living in a middle-class household who is not religious. These are my most defining intersecting social identities. For many people, the identities that make them disadvantaged are the ones that are most prominent in their lives. As we learn about our identities subconsciously and consciously, we grow into them. We begin to compare them to other people's identities. It is a socialized behavior to compare oneself to each other, and it is a socialized behavior to rank our identities. What's interesting about being a person with oppressed identities is that the ranking of identities is not about which one is better or more privileged, but about which one is more oppressed. We do this for many reasons. Our most oppressed identities are the most painfully and repetitively experienced. The painful experiences that make the, most, make the most prominent experiences in our lives and therefore become the most important. And that pain never goes away. When we determine which one of our identities is more oppressed, we often choose to fight for the equity of that identity. Doing this begins the ranking of our identities and the identities of others. This ranking or hierarchy of oppression, of oppressed identities, frequently also becomes our downfall to our fight for social justice. We inadvertently choose who we are fighting for and who we then politely say, sorry, but my oppression is actually more important than yours. Some of you may be thinking, why is this our downfall for our fight for social justice? If I fight for the identity, which I am most passionate about, for two reasons. I'm sorry, I should have moved this earlier. <laughs> Identities intersecting. Um, but for two reasons. One is because of the numbers, and two, because it then becomes an internal debate. Because we, as people, are then forced to choose between, most likely, our multiple oppressed identities and our intersecting I'm going to give examples of the numbers and then about the internal debate. So the first one, a simplified <coughs> example about the numbers is if we look at race alone and the fight for racial justice, assuming that people will only fight for the racial identity in which they identify, if we look at the US Census from 2010, this is the racial breakup. Can we all see the numbers? <coughs> I'm just going to read a few of them. So 12.6% black or African American, 0.9% American Indian, Alaska Native, 4.8% Asian, and so on. These numbers show that if people only fought for the racial justice for which they identify, we are fighting an unwinnable war. Fundamentally, yes. It is an egocentric inclination that people would only fight for their racial identification. And within identity development, pain is a really hard experience to let go. So who wouldn't fight for their own racial justice? However, if we fight for a racial justice for a larger group, for example, a group of people of color, when our odds be better? And adding all this up, our percentage then becomes 43.9%. So an example of our internal debate, um, I'm gonna actually use a, my own personal experience through that. Um, in 1983, Audre Lorde wrote an essay called There's No Hierarchy of Oppression. And that's Audre Lorde right there. A liberation from ha When I read this one page essay, I felt a liberation a liberation from having to choose between my oppressed identities, but also between my own guilt for being Asian and wanting to fight for social justice. 
As I was learning about my identities, oppressed and privileged, of my visible oppressed identities, I understood why being a woman was an oppressed identity. And I shared many of the same oppressed experiences that other women had experienced. I, however, have a much more defining visible intersecting identity, Asian. I had trouble feeling comfortable calling my Asian identity, especially my East Asian identity, as oppressed. I felt a pain of guilt being Asian and calling myself a person of color. Because I knew that the history of Asian oppression in the United States could not compare to the oppression that black and African Americans have experienced. I knew that being East Asian, that I'm considered a model minority. I knew that Asians kept their mouths shut and assimilated to white culture. Because we don't want to make waves. Because we think that if we do this, we'll gain an edge in society. And that if we keep our heads down and work hard, we can achieve and live that American dream. So I did this, for the most part, unconsciously for most of my life. Because I wanted to be like everyone else. I wanted to be white, middle class American. As I started to read and learn more about racial identity development when I was 28 years old, I was really confused. Why am I a person of color? Why does our society see me as different? I express myself as American by speaking American English. I dress like I'm American. I wear makeup and so on, right? That same year, I read a memoir by Elaine Marr called Paper Daughter. It was then that I recognized the uncanny similarities of her experience to mine because of three of our intersecting identities, Asian, immigrant, and woman in that order. Reading this memoir made me realize that I was different in ways that I cannot change. Because <coughs> these are the identities I was born into. This experience helped me understand that my racial identity, immigration status, and gender identity were oppressed identities. However, I still felt guilty because I was East Asian. And I can, but I can kind of counteract that with being an immigrant, right? So that made me feel just a little bit better, but not really. Because as I continued to learn more about race, reading about the experiences of black, Latinx, and native lives in the United States, and listening to people's own experiences, I started recognizing that I had internalized biases that I had internalized biases against black, Latinx, and native persons. And that made me feel horrible. Recognizing my internalized biases was my first step in overcoming my guilt. In learning about my internalized biases, I also learned about my own Asian identity and that many of these internalized biases actually came subconsciously and consciously from a list of things. My patriarchal immigrant Asian family. The white suburban communities in which I grew up. The middle to upper class communities in which I lived. The predominantly Christian friends with which I associated the heterosexual people in which I associated, and the perspectives from which I was taught in education. <coughs> I also learned that I couldn't blame these groups because they were teaching me what they had learned. It was within learning about my Asian identity that I also learned about my intersecting identities, my immigrant, my middle class going from Buddhist to non-religious, heterosexual, being a woman, those intersecting identities with my Asian identities, how much 
each of these identities depended upon each other. It was within learning all this that I read Audre Lorde's essay. Her essay helped me understand that creating a hierarchy of oppressions disadvantaged others' oppressions. That if we create a hierarchy of oppression, then we are, in the words of Paul Gray, becoming the oppressor who is oppressing the oppressed. We are, in essence, creating a hierarchy of oppression to support structural oppression. In recognizing, facing, and learning to battle my internalized biases, this helped me overcome my guilt that I had for my privileged identities. My liberation came when I learned that I can change by learning to continually check my own perceptions and biases, that using empathy to think about others and continually learning from other people's experiences, as well as learning through research and learning through reading. So I want to end with a quote from Audre Lorde's essay. I cannot afford to fight one form of oppression only. I cannot afford to believe that freedom from intolerance is the right of only one particular group. And I cannot afford to choose between the fronts upon which I must battle these forces of discrimination wherever they appear to destroy me. And when they appear to destroy me, it will not be long before they appear to destroy you. Thank you.